Hi, Eric here with 30 by 40 Design Workshop. This is part three in our model making series. Uh, part three, we're gonna be looking at all the tools you'll need to begin building architectural models. And I don't wanna intimidate you by thinking you actually need all of these tools. I just thought it'd be interesting to look through my tool set and see the tools I've collected over a number of years that help me build models. And then at the end of the video, I'll just break down the essentials. And I think you basically need six things to get started making models. So out of all these things, just six things. I'll just start here by um, saying, I have a number of these aluminum trays and these are actually little boxes. They have lids here and the lids I use uh, to take tools around with the studio with me as I am building models. Um, and then I can store small parts and pieces in here or clamps, tools that I need. Um, this is from my grandfather's model shop. They use them for autoclaving things, but you can actually buy these in Ikea in the kitchen section by the kitchen rail. They have a whole number of uh, stainless steel storage trays and they're stackable, all different sizes and configurations. So actually kind of a inexpensive and neat little thing to have in a model shop. Uh, moving on here, I have a set of clay tools. So these are more plastic uh, work for working plastic materials, plasticine, clays, things like that. I haven't used these a lot, but my son and I are building a model railroad, so they'll come in handy there. But basically these tools are made for shaping clays and more organic sort of forms. What's nice is for under about $10 uh, on Amazon, you can get uh, about a dozen or so different tools that have double tips. This one has a point here, an all point, so you can uh, stab chipboard and, and put it in place. Great, great uh, versatile tools. And these are scattered about my toolbox. And these trays sort of slip in underneath uh, this tray here in the toolbox. Moving on to this drawer here, which has a whole number of tweezers. Now you can get a tweezer set for about $20. Um, and what's great about these is it has, the instead of it just being a straight tweezer, it has a little kink in the end. And the kink allows you to take a piece and manipulate it in the model, get to a, reach a place that you wouldn't otherwise reach with your thick fingers here. So I, I have about four to six of these that I use regularly. Uh, the small forceps here are actually great for removing splinters from kids' fingers and toes, just uh, so dual purpose tool there. Um, and then this one has a little rivet in it, which allows it to be um, fully closed at all times. Now, this one's particularly useful for gluing. Um, tweezers that close on their own and they can hold pieces and manipulate pieces around in the model. You can dab glue on the end of it and not get the glue all over your fingers. Um, same holds true for painting. If you're holding a small piece to paint or spray, uh, tweezers help keep your modeling clean. So some of the hallmarks of a good modeler are that they have a clean model, uh, one of free of glue and, and uh, errant paint, paint stripes and things like that, um, and also clean cuts. And we'll talk about cutting in a little bit. So forceps and, and these kinds of tools are essential in the toolkit. Uh, I have wire cutters. This is great for cutting piano wire, small metal details. My favorite wire cutters are ones that which have a little spring here, um, which open. So you just nip the wire and, um, and then they open back up again. So heavier gauge tools in the toolbox for cutting heavier gauge wire. Two types of needle nose pliers. One are a rounded tip, and this is great for getting radius bends on the ends of wire uh, metal details, and also for reaching into a model and getting to places that you can't easily access otherwise. Uh, the second type of needle nose pliers, they actually have a square edge here, and I have two gauges, one for bending heavier gauge wire and one for a finer detail. I like using these for bending the tips of wire at a 90 degree angle, so these are great for that. And then more forceps here. Moving along, we have scales and rulers. So you're probably gonna have an architectural scale in your drafting uh, kit, if you're assuming you're doing any hand drawing or scaling drawings on your table. Um, one quick tip here is to take a binder clip and place it on the top of your scale and this allows you to quickly index to whatever scale you're working at in your model. You can certainly use just a regular metal ruler, but having an architectural scale will be um, sort of a shortcut when you're scaling out how long a beam or a column or a wall segment needs to be and you probably have it already. The one disadvantage with architectural scales is they often don't go measure all the way to the tip here and that's why I recommend getting some of these flexible metal rulers. And I have a number of them, so this is pretty flexible, but the measurements go all the way to the end here. This allows you to reach into a model and quickly scale and see how tall something is. 
um, and go right to the end of the ruler. So helpful there. These are also flexible so they can reach into spots that uh, an architectural scale might not easily reach. Uh, one critical tool here is a cork-backed ruler, and this would be for cutting. So you'll use this to guide your utility blade as you're cutting, get nice straight cuts. Um, you need it to be metal because a plastic or a wood ruler will easily cut with the sharp blades we use in architectural modeling. So cork-backed uh, ruler is essential, and the cork on the back actually keeps the ruler from slipping around on the surface that you're cutting on so that you can get nice, confident, clean cuts here. Uh, one drawback of this metal ruler in particular is that as you're cutting, the blade will skip over and will nick the side of your hand or cut the side of a finger off as happened to me when I was a first year architecture student. Um, so to an upgraded version of this would be something like the Aluma Cutter, which actually has a ridge that runs down the middle, acts as a finger guard. So when the blade does slip, and this will happen, uh, it hits the, uh, the guide as opposed to your finger. Uh, get a couple of different sizes. It's nice to have a small one that will fit on a small cutting mat. It's also nice to have a 24 inch one. I have a 24 inch one and a 12 inch one, if you're just starting out, is probably the most versatile length there. I have a set of calipers here, which I don't use often, but when I need to measure into spots uh, that I can't easily reach or get a scale into, this is about the only tool that will work. So even though I don't use it often, uh, when I need it, that's the only one that'll work. I have a couple of squares here. Squares are great for uh, aligning with the edge of a table and getting nice square cuts. These are heavy duty stainless steel um, and I can use these for other things in the studio as well. If we look at this, um, this layout tool here that I have, it's a nice heavy piece of steel. I can use the squares to glue up against, I can ensure that I'm getting 90 degree angles here and, and mate these two surfaces together like that. So these can work in conjunction. Um, getting a couple of these were my grandfather's again, but you can find these online pretty easily. Uh, make square cuts. That is a sign of a good model model maker. Uh, this piece, as I said, helps making gluing up 90 degree corners. It also helps in weighing down materials. If I've put glue between two pieces of chipboard and I want it to dry nice and flat, I can use this as a weight. It's, it's nice to have this as a brace around the studio. You'll find all sorts of uses for something like that. Uh, moving around here, we have clamps, and, and these are sort of some of my favorites. These are just plastic. They're made by Exacto. They slide into place quickly, and you just set it with this little pin at the side. So engaging and disengaging is uh, easy, simple, and this acts as a second set of hands when you're gluing something up or you need just need another pair of hands. These metal ones are great for um, soldering, if you're doing any soldering work. They are a little more tedious to use, but they have fi a fine level of adjustment. Uh, they don't slide in and out as quickly as the Exacto ones, but that acts as a third set of hands if you need one. Uh, this little vise is great for gluing things up or holding things vertically in place um, if you're gluing things together. I have a couple of these in a couple of different sizes, uh, but certainly not essential in the, in the toolkit. Sticking along with gluing and pinning things, um, these T-pins are great. Not only are they great for uh, pinups and crits, but if you're doing any kind of layout uh, for your model on a work surface, let's say you have a piece of homosote and you're trying to pin structural elements together, you can do a layout with these pins and uh, quickly index parts and pieces together in a template. Um, these pins will be useful all around the studio, so pick up a box of those. Okay, moving on to files. Files are great when you're working with acrylics in particular. Uh, you can get into places in your model that you can't easily access otherwise. They're great for cleaning up edge details, uh, model uh, glue joints in your model. Um, they're just all around versatile and good for um, cleaning up cuts that aren't as perfect as you want them and working with plastics. Uh, if you don't feel like picking up a set of those, it's nice to actually just have an emery board, super cheap. Um, and it's actually, this is nicer than sandpaper I find for um, sanding off glue joints because it's sort of like a pencil in that it'll sit on your desk and it's easy to, easier to find than some of the papers which tend to get collated with chipboard and your other paper stock on your desk. So this index is like a pencil. Um, nice, nice feature of that. Okay, let's move on to some of the cutting tools. Uh, cutting is important and we'll talk about, we'll begin by talking about the cutting mats and you'll see these are work 
acting as my work surface here. Um, I have two cutting mats. If you're just starting out, I recommend getting a smaller one first. This is a 12 by 18, so 12 inches this way, 18 inches this way. And an upgraded size is an 18 by 24. Uh, the important part is to get something that is sized to your work surface. Uh, the smaller one is nice because it's a small surface that will not consume a lot of desk area. If you have a large drafting table, chances are it's consumed with drawings and a lot of other tools. So this would be a nice dedicated uh, work surface. If you have a larger table, a larger cutting mat is definitely better. It gives you more room to cut larger sheets, uh, more room to spread out your tools. But when you're buying them, buy the small one first, make sure it fits on your desk, then upgrade to the larger one. And when you do that, make sure it, it um, correlates with the proportion of the previous one you bought. So the 12 by 18 is nice correlating with an 18 by 24. I can stack the 18 inch dimensions and suddenly my 24 inch cutting surface turns into a 36 inch cutting surface that's 18 inches deep. Uh, cutting mats keep your blades sharper, longer, uh, rather than cutting on the floor or a piece of cardboard or another piece of wood. The cutting mat is self-healing. It gives a nice flat surface to glue on. It's got a grid of lines that you can use to align your cork back to metal ruler up to and get nice straight cuts. General all-purpose work surface that protects other more precious surfaces beneath it as well. So you'll want to pick up uh, one or two of those. As we get into cutting here now, well, there are two general types you, um, that you'll want to get. There's the utility knife, and this is my favorite. This is the Olfa L2. Uh, this has been with me since the, my first day of architecture school, and it's, it's really a beloved um, possession. It has nice thick blade. The blade allows you to cut, the, the depth of the blade allows you to cut all sorts of uh, thicknesses of materials. And it's actually very comfortable in your hand. So it's easy to wield, it's easy to maneuver. It doesn't induce a lot of stress. And that kind of sounds silly, but if you've been cutting for an hour or two, um, hand fatigue is a real issue. And so it, the fact that it fits nicely in your palm is good. The blades are scored here, so you can snap them off easily when you need to. When your blade is becoming dull, you'll snap that off and you'll have a fresh blade here. If you get the black uh, blades, those are extra sharp, so pick up a big package of those. You know, I have a number of blades in here for all of my different um, uh, knives, but you'll want to get lots of extra sharp blades. Now, X-Acto uh, blades, I don't use these a lot anymore. Uh, what I do use them for is cutting paper, mylar, cardstock, trace, things that have fine detail, that have a real exacting uh, quality. These are number 11 blades. The trouble with these is the tips uh, will break off pretty readily. And once the tip breaks off, they don't cut very well at all. So a little tip here is once your blade becomes dull, you notice it's dull, if you have two knives, you can mark one with a red tip on the uh, on the end so you know which is which. Take the blade you're gonna be changing out and put it into your second knife. This second knife then can be used for gluing and for rough cuts, things that maybe uh, would damage a, a brand new fresh sharp blade. These will induce hand fatigue because they're so small. Um, and because I'm using my laser cutter for a lot of the fine detail work, I don't end up using these uh, for much of anything. Uh, one other little tip is to get a foam block here that you can um, store your, your X-Actos in and that'll keep them from rolling around on the desk. It also helps storing pins and things like that. Uh, one last thing, um, no, two last things with cutting. One is to get a pair of scissors and I like the little bonsai tree trimming scissors because you can reach into a model and trim off a piece and then when they go dull, um, you won't feel bad about recycling them and buying another pair. They're a couple of dollars each. But when you have something in place in the model and you can't be destructively reaching in there with your X-Acto or your Olfa knife, um, having a quick pair of metal scissors with fine tips, um, very useful. Um, and then the Dremel tool is the last cutting tool. Having cutoff discs, these um, multi-purpose cutoff discs are nice when you have to reach in and in, again into a model and cut very precise cuts. Um, makes it faster cutting balsa wood and basswood and columns and sticks and things like that. So that's it for, for the cutting. Um, okay, let's move on to adhesives now. There are two primary types of adhesives. There's wet adhesives and dry adhesives. When you're thinking about which adhesive you wanna use, you wanna look at the material you're trying to join and cater the adhesive to that material. For the most part, you're gonna be using wet adhesives, things like PVA glues, polyvinyl acetates. That's Elmer's or Aileen's or Sobo, Mod Podge, 
wood glues, foam glues, things like that. These will handle most of your needs. I have a preference for Elmer's because I like the way it dries. It dries matte, it dries clear. Also the pieces when you're modeling using chipboard and you need to remove a piece, say you put something in, you wanna change, make a change, Elmer's removes nice and cleanly. It doesn't rip the face of the chipboard or the cardboard like an Aileen's might or like a Sobo might. The other advantage with Elmer's is it's not all gummy and glommy. Uh, Sobo tends to dry to a glossy finish and this gumminess of it attracts a lot of dirt and dust. And in model making, that's a bad thing. When your glue joints are glommy and gummy and dusty and dirty, it makes your model look of a lower quality. So I prefer Elmer's. One little tip here is when you get a big jug of Elmer's, uh, also get a small bottle and pour the, the large jug into the small one. This saves you a little bit of time when you're tipping the glue container over and, and gluing. It's just faster to use a smaller container. Other people uh, prefer glue syringes. I'm, I just haven't used them uh, very often, but that's also an option. Wood glues for gluing a lot of your woods together. Uh, Mod Podge is nice because it's a little uh, tackier and a little gummier, um, so you can use it for painting on large surfaces if you're laminating pieces together. The other uh, wet glues are things like uh, foam glues for tacking EPS glue together, or like a Gorilla Glue would be used for um, joining XPS foam or the rigid foams together. Um, you wanna get a glue that works with the foam in particular, but doesn't also eat it away. Uh, and the last part we'll talk about with uh, the wet glues are things like CA glues, super glues, uh, cyanoacrylates, um, these plastic solvents. Basically, these are used to weld plastic pieces together, good for styrenes um, and mo model building in general. Plastic pieces, acrylics, things like that. If you have clear acrylics, a lot of these things won't work because uh, these cements will end up crazing the, the or fogging the plastics. And so for those, you'll want to use a dry adhesive. Dry adhesives are good for materials that are affected adversely by water absorption. So, you know, if you notice when you're gluing pieces of chipboard together, if you're using a CA glue, oftentimes the pieces will ripple when you put them together. Um, and that's the reason for having some weights to, to really weight them down while the glue sets. Um, but if you absolutely can't have those ripples, say in a wood or cardboard situation, you can use dry adhesives, things like double-sided tapes or gaffer's tape or masking tape or drafting dots. Uh, things like this will help hold these pieces together. Um, and if you have plastics which uh, would be affected by crazing or fogging, you could oftentimes use double-sided tape for those situations. The classic sort of dry adhesive here is uh, 3M Super 77, often known as spray mount. Spray mount is, um, it's not inexpensive, which oftentimes in studio means people will borrow it for extended periods of time or it may go missing. Uh, but this is really useful for attaching drawings, spraying the backside of a, a plan drawing, for example, and then mounting it to a piece of cardboard and using it for templating. So if you use a little bit of this on the back of your drawing and place it on the cardboard, you can use that then to cut out your design or a detailed structural piece or something like that. There's also hairspray that will hold uh, light, fluffy things in place, um, foams and things like that. So quite sticky. And then the last of these is uh, the glue gun. And you know, this is kind of a wet adhesive, kind of a dry adhesive, but it's multi-purpose. I prefer the larger glue guns. They have more power. They just tend to last longer. You get more glue in a stick. The mini glue guns are kind of hard to hold in your hand. They don't heat up as quickly. They cool down faster and you just have less overall glue to run through the glue gun. Be careful when you're using this for gluing things like foam. You may want to get a dual temperature glue gun, which also will work with foam. If you use a hot glue gun on foam, it will melt right through it. Um, so pick that up. You can also get wood glue sticks for that as well. Okay, moving on. We have other cutting devices like uh, razor saws here, and the razor saw has a miter box with it that you can use to cut columns at different angles. Um, it also has interchangeable blades. These can be nice for getting into a model and removing pieces, uh, accessing areas you, you wouldn't otherwise get to. Um, I don't end up using this a whole lot now that I have a Dremel tool, but I definitely use that in school. I have these boxes which store everything and these are kind of cool because my grandfather made them and I get to have them kicking around the studio but it's nice to have individual slots and places to put all of these things so that everything has a home in the studio. 
This has uh, sandpaper, steel wool, sanding blocks. Um, that sort of builds on what we talked about with the emery board here. Um, you'll want to use those for frosting plastics, um, cleaning up metals, things like that. As we come over to the toolbox here, I have larger tools that don't fit anywhere else, things like pliers, hammers. I've got some screwdrivers in there. Here I have a drawer full of paint brushes and more sculpting tools. I have a series of dental tools and pins in there. One drawer is dedicated to small brads and um, uh, fasteners, some toothpicks. That's a sort of catch-all drawer. Then I have jewelers, um, uh, drivers, and also some Allen keys in there. And then this is filled with miscellaneous ephemera, uh, good for various modeling tasks. This is where I keep all my rulers and squares in that drawer. And then I have my blades and some marking tools on this side that's helpful for sketching on surfaces and also for marking where I wanna make cuts. Okay, so this is the large grouping of tools that I have, tools that I use you know, frequently and maybe infrequently in, in some of the cases. I think essentially there are six things that you need to get started building architectural models. The first and most important thing is your utility knife. Okay, you're gonna want to get something that's large and something that's easy to hold in your hand. I prefer the Ulfa L2, we talked about that. You wanna get lots of extra blades. So the black blades are actually sharper than, than these that I have here. Um, but you have basically eight blades for every one of these and I just get it in the plastic container. Whenever your knife gets dull, snap a blade off. That'll keep your models looking sharp and, and nice. We talked about cutting mats. You definitely wanna get a cutting mat, get it sized to your table. We talked about metal rulers. A cork back ruler is a good starting point. The Aluma cutter is the upgraded option. Start with a 12 inch and then build out your sizes from there, 24 and down to a six in that priority order. You wanna get some glue. Probably PVA glue is a good place to start. The upgraded option, get a glue gun. That'll be great for making corrugated cardboard models, just holding things together, quickly sketching things out. Get the specialty glues if you're gonna be working with acrylics or acetates or other materials that require a specialty adhesive. And the last thing is a toolbox. If you don't have a hand-me-down that you can work with, uh, I suggest getting one of the Stanley toolboxes, which are great because they're modular. They have nice ball bearing slides on the drawers and they're lockable. So if you're working in a studio environment, you don't want your tools to walk off if you ever decide to leave or have time to leave. Um, getting a locking toolbox is great. The Stanley ones, you can buy a base for them in the future with wheels. You can turn it into a whole mobile working studio. So that's it. These are my favorites. I think there are six things that you need to start building models. You don't need all this stuff, but I hope it was enjoyable for you to see kind of the collection, the things that I've collected over a number of years of building models. Um, it's really a lifelong vocation. So building this tool set um, builds the meta skills that you need throughout your architecture career and whatever you decide to do uh, in your free time. This applies to hobbies as well as other things. So let me know in the comments what I missed and uh, thanks for watching.